Stan Jabalisco here, proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1GV, Whiskey One Good Vibrations. I'm going to tell you another little story. I don't think I've ever told this story before. It's about my very first uh, shortwave listening receiving antenna, which for a while after I got my novice ham radio license in March of 1966 also served as my transmitting antenna. The receiver was a Halicrafters SX-130, Sierra X-Ray 130, shortwave general coverage receiver. They called them general coverage meaning the, well, the lowest frequency it could receive was 535 kilo cycles. At that time, these hertz were called cycles. And the highest frequency was 30 megacycles. By the way, when they changed over from cycles to hertz, most ham radio operators, it seems to me, and shortwave listeners, uh, of course, hertz being named after the pioneer in radio, Heinrich Hertz, uh, when they changed cycles to Hertz, everybody thought it was stupid. <laughs> they, would, they just thought it was idiotic. What are we going to do next? You know, are we going to call, well, volts were named after Volta or Voltaire. I, I don't know which one for sure. Currents named after a scientist named Ampere. Uh, resistance, the unit was named after the uh, scientist Ohm, O-H-M, so it, maybe it wasn't so stupid, but we, uh, I remember reading a, about a lot of people thinking it was really dumb. Um, I mean, you, you call lights, lo light intensity by lumens, what are you going to call it by now? Um, well, we, we, we've already got Newtons. I, you, know, you know how it goes. How about Einsteins? Is there a unit called the Einstein? There probably is. There should be if there isn't. Well, anyway, that was the receiver, a general coverage receiver uh, from the medium and high frequency portion of the short wave, so-called short wave and medium wave radio spectrum. And I had that receiver located in our fallout shelter that was in case we had a nuclear war, which we were very concerned about after the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. We uh, read all about uh, how to survive a nuclear war uh, because the radioactive particles that were blown into the atmosphere by the atomic bombs could stick around for weeks and months. And so we'd had to have a shelter in the basement in which we could survive for weeks or months. And we even stocked it with canned food. I don't think there was a porta potty in there. I don't know. I guess we'd just run out real quick and go to the bathroom and get back as soon as we could. And our a five, you know, three kids and two adults in a room maybe eight by ten feet. And it had a meandering hallway uh, so that uh, no radiation could travel in a straight line from any radioactive particle to the interior of that fallout shelter. So my wire antenna, uh, which was, it was just a random wire, maybe 100, 150 feet long, started at the radio, ran along the ceiling through that mirandering, mirandering corridor and out through a hole we drilled in the siding of the house somewhere and then up the house into a number of trees. And that was it. There was no feed line per se. It was just a wire antenna connected to the shortwave radio, which optimized uh, somehow the match between the impedance match between the antenna and the radio by means of a control called antenna trim or antenna trimmer. I didn't know what, I didn't have the foggiest idea why they called it antenna trim. On the panel it said ant trim, 
uh, and I knew it was antenna trim, but I didn't know what in the world it did. But you would tune that thing around until you got a peak in the received signal at whatever frequency, and it would be a different setting as you changed frequencies. And I had a lot of fun, just shortwave listening. And when I got my novice license, it was uh, a few months before I learned that a coaxial fed dipole antenna might work better. So I just used that wire and that was my very first antenna. It was soft drawn copper that I bought at the hardware store or maybe at one of those Radio Shack stores that existed back then. Insulated, soft drawn copper, uh, probably about 150 feet. I might have had to uh, connect two or three of them in series to get that much wire. I did not use zip cord or lamp cord. Just, just uh, I don't know what they called it. They, they just called it, uh, I, I, like I said, I forget. But what was your first antenna? The very first antenna you used when you were a shortwave listener, or maybe you started out with walkie-talkies, or handhelds, or handy-talkies. Or maybe you jumped right in to ham radio and your first antenna was a five-element Yagi for 20 meters at 100 feet, or something like that. Or maybe your first antenna was nothing more than a wire laying on the floor of your bedroom. What was it? How did it work? What did you graduate to? You know, it'll tell me a little bit about your own experience. But that was my first antenna. And I did make a lot of contacts with that crystal controlled Johnson Viking adventurer transmitter, 50 watts plate power input to an 807 or 807 vacuum tube final. I remember it all. You peak the grid, you dip the plate, and uh, the, the, you peak the grid current, you dip the plate current, you used crystals, and, and you couldn't move your frequency, so you better pick up a, a good one. And that was that. Back then, my license, my very first license, was WN0OKV, Whiskey, November Zero, Oscar, Kilo, Victor in Northeast Rochester, Minnesota, USA. Ah, have I come that far since then? Except for aging about 60 years. Well, not 60, 50 years? No, 54 years, oh, okay. Well, 1966 to 2020, you do the math. Stan Gibalisco, W1GV saying 73 and so long, which for all that time from then till now has always translated in my native fist to da-da-da-da-da-da.